friends, we will proceed with the, the plenary session. I understand Dr. Trehan had to go for a meeting with the, at the Prime Minister's office. If that Dr. Trehan is here, I would like Dr. Trehan to come and join. We have had the privilege of working with Dr. Trehan for some time. Last year when we had meetings with Dr. Trehan and Council General for looking at opportunities to come to Canada, working with the universities, be it skill development or research, Dr. Trehan immediately accepted our invitation to come and participate in the conference. If Dr. Trehan. Yeah, Trehan is joining just now. Yeah. So we, we look forward to seeing Dr. Trehan coming and sharing his um, uh, thoughts. In spite of his pressing time with other, other, other engagements, we are privileged that Dr. Trehan is there to join us. Dr. Trehan. Dr. Lakshmanan? Yes. Already in the audience, somebody will have to join him. Why don't you go with the next speaker and then he will join next? Okay. Let, let's well, allow to speak. Well, I now will request Dr. Krishna Yella from Bharat Biotech. Dr. Krishna Yella, Chairman and Managing Director. Friends, we spoke yesterday how from research lab to manufacture and taking it to the marketplace, what it took eight or nine years to go from research lab to the marketplace. Today, our scientists and uh, industry is coming together within a period of a year. Dr. Krishna Yella with his leadership took the vaccine developed with, at the national lab and we are very privileged that Dr. L. Krishnayala has kindly agreed to join us and sharing his experience, doing such a wonderful job for the, you know, with, the, with, the, with the Bharat Biotech. We are all very proud about Bharat, you know, we talk about uh, Pfizer, we talk about Madonna, we talk about AstraZeneca taking from Oxford University. We here have a gem taking vaccine from in Indian National Lab to the marketplace within a period of one year. And, and with, the, with the blessings of the government, we are very pleased. Dr. Krishnayala, with all his commitments, he has kindly agreed to join us. Dr. Krishnayala. Thank you, sir. Honored, honored, humble, and uh, Professor Lakshman, sir. Uh, really humble. And uh, I want to really uh, thank all the Indians who are living in Canada. Stay safe. And uh, you are with us, we are with you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think um, my slides are going to be general. In case uh, Trehan comes, I can stop also and take over afterwards also. Not a problem for me. So I'm open for that. So I think my journey, I think I'm going to be thankful to the Canada-India Health Summit. And I want to... Uh, uh, the slide is not moving. So I think my journey is I'm going to make it very general, sir, not very specific to too much of COVID vaccine, but I'm going to share some of the feelings, some of the ideas, what is going on. Uh, and it will, um, this thing, I'm going to talk about simple things. I think next. Today, SARS COVID made the entire world as a village. Now, a problem in India is going to be a problem in US our problem in Canada. So nobody can escape now. If it is not controlled in India, you're not going to control in Canada and US also. So it's a simple, it's a one village now. Next. And I think today, the, the one seven billion people are affected. 
one covid one covid from the agriculture to the service sector to children is not able to go to school and industrial job even unemployed he is also affected migrant workers everybody is affected today globally next so the the future pandemic is going to be i'm not scaring the people but there are 40000 unknown viruses which science not identified there are 10000 out of that are zoonotic that means it goes to animal to human and unfortunately because of deforestation we are going closer to the forest and many of the diseases which are for animal viruses are now coming and hurting us to the human being so now we become part of like an we become like an animals now uh, adapted to the animals now so i think the virus is now choosing both of us right now as a game next next week i think i always say today the neglected disease are tomorrow's global disease tuberculosis was a indian disease today is a global hiv was an african disease today it's a global so no disease will be neglected henceforth all neglected disease are going to be global disease either today or tomorrow it's going to be like that next and unfortunately what happens is most of the neglected diseases starts from the developing world and you look at this slide all these pandemic viruses started from the africa asia and uh, asian continent and african continent and that is how these uh, neglected diseases all totally neglected diseases and it become a finally reach into pandemic position and reach to other part of the world so most of the diseases which have been identified pandemic starts from the developing world next so i think people are talking about india challenges there are two ways everybody criticizes india oh we are not prepared for second wave and all that yes true partly but i want to say that both us and europe also got two waves there also heavy destruction happened heavy lot of death has happened and today india is a complex democracy i mean each state itself is a, a different country within the country so each state is a democracy is different from other part of the world state also that's a complex system but india's first wave what happened is in the first wave slums poor rural areas were affected in that process the challenge was the public health system the government system was challenged in the second wave what happened is the the first wave when it happened people the people middle class and rich people become saying that it is not uh, any more uh, uh, you know the virus is not gone so let's be complacent about it they started traveling they were not using any uh, mask nothing and then that it is now the second wave really hurt the private health care system since dr prehan has come i would uh, request prehan can complete and leave no problem so i can uh, give it to him he is joined right now sir sir you need to go and save some people so please you get <laughs> i'm waiting for you <laughs> so No, so we are having a little. Thank you so much, uh, Krishna. Yes, you are looking good. Very good. Okay. So thank you for that. And I just have been mandated by seven o'clock. I'll have to leave. So, is there a particular role that uh, or thing that you would like me to talk about, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Chairman, or is it uh, free wheeling? Well, Dr. Trehan. your experience addressing the issue of covid is well known well recognized medanta has been in the forefront with uh, uh, offering the healthcare service to the needy people the population in delhi and around your leadership is very impressive and we in canada privilege that medanta has is has found partnership with a major university system in canada and it's a privilege you confirmed participation in the conference about 7 or 8 months back when we were discussing on you on on partnership between university health network and medanta dr tegan on behalf of the organizing committee we invite you to share your thoughts experience and your 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 vision thank you thank you lakshmanan and good to see you again okay so my i would phrase it like covid sars 2 then and now <clears throat> so first wave we uh, we all know what happened that on 5th of march 
a group of tourists from Italy were detected to be positive in Jaipur. And at that time, the Prime Minister, in his wisdom, asked us to take care of them. Well, very little was known about COVID in this part of the world. Anyway, we treated them intensely. Our medical teams were really very uh, sort of embraced it enthusiastically and said, if anybody's going to treat COVID, we will. So then we successfully treated 13 out of the 14 who went home. There was a 79-year-old lady with multiple comorbidities who did not make it. So our experience starts from then. And we know the world became one. There was free exchange of, uh, of information. And then the lockdown came and we broke the chain. We built our healthcare system to a level where we could cope with it. And we did cope with it, the first wave, which peaked at 100 cases a day. Then we were kind of, what happened was that when the numbers started going down, which has happened all over the world also, that things got a little complacent. When people ask us in, in the media who's to blame, my answer is we are all to blame. We are all to blame because as citizens, people kind of being fed up and COVID uh, uh, sort of fatigue, the, uh, the whole world went around like COVID never existed. And there were parties, there were weddings, and there were cultural events, there were, there were religious events, and then there was Kum, and then there was uh, uh, the elections. And all put together, these were the super spreader events that brought this upon us, the second wave. Now, nobody estimated, especially the medical profession and the frontline workers, that we would be hit by a wave with the ferocity and the velocity with which it hit us. Topping 400,000 cases a day, that was unimaginable. So naturally, the, we, we started creaking around the edges first, and as the numbers grew, many crises happened. So first there was a scramble for beds, and we ran out of beds very quickly. Second, with that, because people were getting sick and requiring high, do high doses of oxygen, that we ran out of oxygen. And if you look at it as a comparison, the normal consumption of the medical profession or needs for, uh, for oxygen was 2,200 tons a day. But in this peak, it went up to close to 10,000 tons a day. So there was no way that we had that capacity for medical gases existing. But I must say that industry came to the rescue and, and all the steel industry people, businessmen, volunteered that they have the source of uh, oxygen in their plants, huge amounts they use, and they would repurpose it very quickly for medical use and we offer it to the country at large, even if they had to close down their plants just to be able to provide relief to the people who you saw in, in great distress. So India then ramped up and now we are about 9,700 tons. And uh, now we find we are comfortable, but two weeks were very nerve wracking for all of us because we were functioning on one hour reserve, half an hour reserve. But I must say the government did a great job with the, with the resources that it had it imported a lot of tankers to carry the, the liquid oxygen from the plants to, to us. So all that happened and that is all history. But then now what happened is that the waves are kind of becoming less and less in areas which it hit first. That is Maharashtra and the Delhi NCR were the first to suffer because they happened to be the hubs of international travel. And many, many variants came and, and some of the variants started appearing in India itself. So what we saw in this wave, different from the last wave, was two very distinct things. One, largely the younger people were spared in the first wave. We saw many, many more patients in the second wave than in the first wave below the age of 45 who were affected and so much so that many of them lost their lives. The so second thing is the older people also 
were become became much sicker. So it was not uncommon for us to see HRCT scans, which showed 80, 85 percent, even 90 percent lung involvement. That we had not seen in the first wave. So that means that the the infectivity, the affectation of this new virus, whichever we are, we are coming up with some mut mutants and whatever it was that began and now where it's landing up was that it was the infection was much more intense than we saw in the first wave. So what has happened now is that with the dip in numbers in institutions like ours, which is located in the NCR Delhi region and institutions in Mumbai and some of the other cities where the, the ferocity was huge to begin with, that we are seeing diminishing numbers in new admissions. And also Delhi just declared that their positivity rate is down below 5%. And that is quite evident from what we see in admissions in the hospitals. But all the people who got stuck, who did not get well, they are now working their way through the ICUs. So there is a acute shortage of ICU beds, uh, ventilators and all that. But now it seems like the next couple of weeks is going to be the crunch on these facilities. But along with that now, there is problem with, with uh, mucormycosis. Now, institutions like ours, which are like in the center of all this, have found right like now we are, we are dealing with 50 patients admitted who are mainly the same, same vulnerability of high dose of steroids for a prolonged period, diabetics whose diabetes was not controlled well during this whole uh, high dose of, uh, of uh, steroids, and people who are already immunosuppressed because of kidney transplants, liver transplants. So those are the people we see have now actually accumulated in hospital like ours. And uh, they, the, the problem that is created right now is the fact that amphotericin, lipo, liposomal amphotericin, which was, which is manufactured in some facilities in India, but mainly brought from overseas, we find that there is a, a huge shortage because the normal supply was, was insignificant. And now suddenly we need huge numbers to cope with the, number, the cases that are evident in India. And there is some suggestion that there may, may have topped 5,000 today. So that's the latest crisis. Now, what to learn from all this is that if we were not so clever or not cautious enough that we let all these events happen and we are suffering for it today, that's the lesson from this whole pandemic today. Second, the fact that we are expecting a third wave sometime in the future. And if we live with these lessons, and with, we know that only three things that we can do is to one, educate the public and insist, not only the public, but the authorities and everybody in tandem, insist that we, we go back to a double up in our COVID appropriate behavior. So when we are saying now, because this virus seems to be more virulent than the one before, that we should double mask if you are going into outside into a marketplace or something. We should even be, use masks liberally in the house itself and not try to crowd together in one room, which is not well ventilated. So all those things we have said, okay. And we are on the TV day and night, stressing it again and again and again, because that's our first line of defense. The second thing is that we need to build our healthcare system, the, the hospitals, the supply of oxygen, medications, training of personnel, inducting more personnel because there's an acute shortage and, and there's a lot of fatigue that has set in over the last 15 months that we need to prepare. If God forbid, there is a third wave, we don't know whether it will be less than this second wave, more than the second wave we don't know but if you look at historically and we we should have learned a lesson from the spanish flu pandemic that there was a second wave and it came much faster the velocity was higher 
and it was the peak was much higher than the first wave. So this virus has behaved the same way 100 years later. And now the third wave in the Spanish flu was not so high. The peak, it peaked out at half of the second wave. So now it's very possible that we, all the preparations that we are doing, and the main concern today is that the wave of this uh, infection is moving from west to east, and along the way it is spreading to the rural areas. Who, who, they are experiencing a huge problem. There are so many deaths in there. There's lack of facilities, lack of oxygen. So we are working day and night in trying to get all these facilities out to the villages and into the rural area. So that's our focus right now. And then on the back of our mind, we are preparing for the third wave. So we, I mean, and just to give you a little uh, overview of it, uh, I think there's not much to talk about because the media is actually communicating on a daily basis. But behind the scene, there is intense uh, discussions going on with the government. The Supreme Court has formed a committee. Uh, I, I'm serving on that committee to really do the future planning for all the things that I said. Thank you very much. If there's anything that I can add, feel free to ask me. Otherwise, there are such eminent speakers. I'm sure they will, uh, they will give you the full flavor of their own fields. Dr. Trehan, thank you very much. In spite of your pressing engagements, you have kindly offered your, um, your, your thoughts, shared your experience. We, we from Canada Foundation Organization Committee, we're grateful for your participation. Thank you very much, Dr. Trey. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you, Mila, again. We may now, we, we, we now request Dr. Krishan Yella to continue with his presentation. Dr. Yella, you have been so gracious to accommodate our no, no. request. <laughs> Thank you very much. Kindly, kindly I'm, not, I'm not going to save too many people, but Dr. Trehan will save more people. <laughs> so I want him to be here. <laughs> That's important. Uh, doctor is important. Um, I think I was talking about um, where the challenges over public health, the private health system is really worst affected in this uh, second wave. And I think, you know, Indian vaccines, my journey is Indian vaccines, you know, people ask, why is India so vaccine manufacturing hub? Why we fail in catering to the world? Or why India has not been vaccinated? That's one of the biggest questions people have been asking about India's capability. But I, uh, I want to tell you that Indian vaccine manufacturers focus on children vaccines. Two out of three children in the developing world are using Indian vaccines. So India's popular, children's population is 25 million children, and we've been fully vaccinating, and the entire developing world, we are supplying all the vaccines. So we're good. When it comes to adult vaccine, as Indian manufacturers, we were not geared up for that angle to meet the entire 1.3 billion population. How do you cater those uh, uh, population with the two dose, 2.6 billion doses is an Herculean task. I think, you know, what US also did, inactivated is not feasible for them, they took mRNA vaccine strategy. It was scalable and quick to go into the market, and they did. And I think that's a, one of the good things happened there in that uh, technology helped uh, in controlling the transmission. And I think, you know, but in spite of that, India has not done bad in delivery of the vaccine because we still both Serum Institute and Bharat, we delivered almost 200 million doses to Indian population and may not be meeting the two, two billion doses, but we are there. Will be there soon, one way or other. But I think, you know, I want to just tell that India is a different country as we go along, along right now. It is not changing country and uh, getting a younger population is getting into much more active into the entrepreneurship and startups. And I think, you know, um, one, I'm the one of the good startup came from US in 96, 97, started this company. And my feeling was to work on neglected diseases of the developing world and not to compete multinational, leader in the emerging market. And I never think that US and uh, Canada is my competitor, but I always think the infectious disease are competitor. 
and i think for my success story it's a public private partnership why this is important as we i speak it will tell you how this public partnership helps in even controlling some of the pandemic and i think you know uh, thanks to get foundation and us indo us wrap program all helped us to build a bigger game as a startup company to build on solving a lot of new stories and i think we have different vaccines platform is there with us that is not important we are are catering to the most of the developing world more than 120 countries we are catering to the vaccine but again mostly uh, to the children's vaccine uh, babies vaccine but we are supplying adult vaccine only one vaccine vaccine we supply is the rabies vaccine and i think we are doing extremely clinical trial also as a startup in 96 we are going into globally again in emerging market including us clinical trials uh, including uk we have done the clinical trial that speaks that a startup can reach into different directions in the vaccine field and i think we have a strong in patent position and i think we have thanks to get a lot of international agency particular bill and melinda gate foundation and uh, us indo us wrap program we are really thankful to them all that and i think the first vaccine rotavac i don't think we are third company in the world next to merck and gsk to come out this rotavirus vaccine in the world and i think it has came from the field from all india institute of medical science to the field and complete all the clinical trial including efficacy trial in the newborn babies and now we brought it to miniaturize the delivery system that is like a polio it can be delivered rotavirus vaccine which even multinational has not thought about it they put delivery almost 2 ml dose into the mouth whereas we brought to fight a simple drop concept and this we change the revolutionize the delivery system of diarrheal vaccine in the developing world i think with uh, gate foundation gave us uh, one of the important project this is the first type of conjugate vaccine in the world even us and uh, europe has not developed this vaccine including gsk and sanofi has not developed and we were the first vaccine company in the world to develop a type of conjugate vaccine thanks to gate foundation and oxford university they funded us the project for uh, human challenge studies in uh, oxford and we have done an effective enough studies in different part of the world to prove that this vaccine protect protect the people and also antibiotic resistance uh, multi drug resistant typhoid can be controlled with the vaccination in this part of the world and now its expansion is going on including pakistan and we published a very international journal and cepi funded us recently chicken gunya vaccine and 14 million dollars funding and we are now taking it as another pandemic vaccine chicken gunya is another future problem going to be there and you know we asked a question where the chicken gunya came to india in 2006 and 7 these will throw some ideas to some of the people epidemiologists who are looking at it there in the auditorium or in the listening to this speech they will understand we looked at it where this problem came chicken gunya to india and it came india it came from the madagascar from this small island from it came from this island to india based on sequence analysis when we did a sequence analysis it came from madagascar then we asked a simple question what can come from this madagascar then it came the question for us zika so we were working on zika vaccine before mm-hmm. even us thought about it or brazil thought about it and we worked on the zika and it came the we were the first global patent holder of zika vaccine which is in the phase 2 trial and we are also working on that one of the pandemic problem of non typhoidal salmonellosis of an african population and thanks to get welcome trust who funded us and we had just completed phase 1 trial in us at the university of maryland and uh, so this vaccine will be going for trial into the africa and i think covid vaccine i'm coming on shortly on this and i think you know we have three different platform approved in the world right now one is rna vaccine and another one vector based vaccine adenovirus third is inactivated vaccine all three in good and plus good plus and minus points but the inactivated vaccine the most problematic is you need a bsl3 production facility probably we are fortunate we are the only company in the world had a bsl3 a production facility at that time so that's how we chose in the inactivated vaccine as one of the strategy to move fast and we feel that still inactivated vaccine would be a ideal candidate for children's vaccine at least uh, because injectable polio all are true proven that it is a wonderful platform for children so newborn babies and other things but uh, i think you know as uh, professor uh, lakshmanan told me in the beginning itself how we compress the clinical trial thanks to regulatory agency both india europe us everybody worked in that direction to bring it to 10 months 
of regulatory period as against 15 years of uh, uh, gestation period of the vaccine period. Our rotavirus vaccine took 17 years for us to come into market. Typhoid conjugate, it took 12 years to come into the market. Whereas now COVID, it came in less than 12 months. And that's a significant regulatory pathway given by all the regulatory agencies. And our co-vaccine is very simple. COVID, it's a, we had a Vero Cell Culture platform um, funded by Gate Foundation. We have extreme good knowledge on uh, uh, inactivated vaccine. That's the reason why we get into inactivated vaccine. It's not that we love it, but we had an expertise of that. So we also licensed one of the important uh, adjuvant from US, Virovax company. This is funded by National Institute of Health, Washington. And why it is important is the, any injectable vaccine, adjuvanted vaccine, aluminum hydroxide gel, it increases the uh, IgG response. But in a, in a pandemic vaccine, we want more of a cell-mediated and TL, TH1 uh, responses to the body, cell-mediated response. So we want to shift from IgG to TH1. That's how we use the TLR7-8 to shift the immune response to more of a T cell response rather than IgG response. That's why we use this adjuvant. We license from US. We manufacture in India. Now we put this in the adjuvant into that uh, field. We had a BSL-3 and we have done phase one, phase two, phase three. We have done different part of the world because India is a 1.3 billion, very geographically different. Each state is different. And we have done phase one, uh, both north, east, south, west, all the four different uh, zones distributed. And then we have done a phase three efficacy trial, thanks to Equia, which is a US multinational company. They were the site monitoring the clinical trial. We have done 26,000 people in 20, 24 sites all over the country of India. And this is a, probably the first efficacy trial, probably in the developing world for COVID vaccine. And uh, we've done uh, neutral vari uh, variants of concern is a problem, as uh, Dr. Prehan was talking about the, uh, the mutants and all that. In the second wave, <clears throat> we got more effect than double mutant. So this double mutant is the, where I shown the signal where the double mutation has occurred. Uh, that region is now causing a problem. Now, South Africa also has got a problem mutation, but that mutation, unfortunately, that South African strain has not spreaded so much of transmission. Brazil P1 is also spreaded in Brazil, but that is not transmitted so much. UK is the one which has high transmittability, but not a highly lethal. But this is the Indian double mutant or whatever the Indian variant of uh, this double mutant B1567, I think it seems to be more lethal right now. As we speak in the second wave, this got the highest uh, burden. In the first wave, we didn't have this one, but the first one, the, we got more of a 1.17 or Wuhan straight was there. But now we are seeing more of a 1.617 or 617.2 is also getting into problem. Uh, 0.2 is also getting into problem. And that is what is causing a lot of lethality and uh, people getting into intensive care and all that. So we are also concerned about the vaccine right now. How do we replace like a flu vaccine strategy with 1.617.2 replaced with the Wuhan strain? And so that vaccine will be more effective. Uh, so that strategy of flu strategy we're working on right now to make it to happen. And I think other COVID vaccine also we're working in the pipeline, uh, intranasal vaccine with Washington University St. Louis. That is in the phase one trial right now. And also we're working with Thomas Jefferson we work with the rabies chimeric, uh, rabies, uh, chimeric vector based vaccine, and that is also getting into phase one trial into India. And, um, and I think, you know, people ask, I ask the question what happens if the pandemic disappears by end of the middle of next year, if it disappears? We have too many technologies in the, will come into the picture, into the market. Too many production facilities are going to be created. Too many companies on a vaccine. Many Indian pharma company. They're also moving into vaccine companies. And too many scientists diverted who are working on therapeutic segment, they're all diverted into vaccine field. And are too many repurpose of consumables. Many monoclonal antibodies are going to be shortage globally because they're all, all the consumables are taken away the vaccine companies. And those monoclonal antibodies are going to be suffering in the future. Future is going to be scary because if this sort of strategy will happen, what will be those facilities will be utilized is also going to be challenging for the post-pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. And again, thank you very much, sir.
for giving an opportunity for me to talk to all of you. Um, it's really humble. I'm humbled to see you all of you. Thank you. Dr. Lakshmanan, you are on mute. Dr. Krishnayala, thank you very much for coming and participating, sharing your experience, serving the population, the humankind, having, helping with healthy human capital around the world to run the economy of the world, to keep people, their jobs and governments happy with what they have been doing. Thank you, Dr. Krishnayala. And you are all part of the great success story we hear. India is the pharma hub of the world. We talk, but you do. And you help us talking to the whole world. What a great job India has been doing, helping the, helping the global population. Thank you very much, Dr. Krishnayala. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, friends, <clears throat> we now will invite Dr. Choko Valiapa. <clears throat> I may have to say a few words about Choko. People think, people invest, they talk about return on investment, and they say, is it 30%, 40%, 50%? But Mr. Choko Valiapa's situation, they are compassionate entrepreneurs. They are not looking for dividends. They are not looking for return on investment in the normal category. Friends, this family, Choco's family, for, se for several years, nearly 100 years, they helped the community, bringing bonded laborers from other countries, giving them jobs, establishing industries, textile, and otherwise. They helped rural population in skill development, training them, bring them to the marketplace, giving them jobs, employment. Not alone they create jobs, but they also invest in education and healthcare. As an example, friends, a couple of days back when I spoke to Mr. Chokovalepa, he shared what they are doing now. They are putting up nearly 1,500 beds near a steel plant because steel plant in Salem produces oxygen. You have been hearing for the last three, four weeks that steel plants from Jamshedpur, be it Tata's or Jindal, whatever it is, taking oxygen from steel plants to Delhi or anywhere else. Here, Mr. Choko Valiapa, with his innovative mind, because Tamil Nadu is one of the most urbanized state in India, he is donating, putting 1,500 beds near steel plant so oxygen is available and helping the community. This tells you innovatively how he engages himself to help the population. Friends, we have had the privilege of bringing Choco to Canada for forming partnership with the best of the best hospital system in Canada, fourth best in the world, already signed to do projects with the University Health Network Toronto, working with Milos and this group. And we are very proud to say our engagement with India has resulted in participation, not alone from healthcare service to healthcare service, university to university, but also bringing engineering companies, manufacturing companies to offer their help to Can Canadians forming partnership, developing technology to serve the companies. Mr. Valipa Choco, it has been a privilege to know you. Choco, I now request you to share your thoughts. Mr. Choco Valiapa. Choco. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Dr. Lakshmanan. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for that kind introduction. So really appreciate uh, you as well as the entire organizers uh, of the Canada-India Healthcare Summit uh, this year. I know it's troubling times and, uh, and I think uh, this is a, a kind of a uh, silver lining in the cloud uh, that we have technology and we have uh, learned people like all of you here and as well as our audience uh, who are navigating through this pandemic uh, and hope, uh, hopefully we'll come out of this quickly. So just in one quick sentence to uh, encapsulate what we do, 
the Sona Group uh, educates and engineers the world to serve society. Uh, it strives to make people health, yeah. healthier. We do this to bring global prosperity. So that's our endeavor for the last 100 years. Uh, the conferences uh, uh, with Dr. Lucky Lakshman, Dr. Arun Choklingam, all of them have really put together uh, superb speakers. And I was listening to the conference yesterday as well as today. Uh, so it's a, it's a big ask to follow. So. Uh, and uh, so, you know, yesterday I was listening to some of the keynotes and uh, uh, your uh, minister, uh, uh, Michael uh, uh, Triblo, uh, the health minister spoke about mental health. So mental health is actually, uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually closely involved with it as we speak, uh, because uh, uh, it, most of it, anyone you meet, either they are going through mental health issues, their organization, like, you know, the employees are going through mental health issues, or their families, especially uh, uh, the trauma of COVID and trauma of losing people and putting youngsters, closeting them inside houses. Uh, all of this is causing mental health issues. So I'm actually uh, spearheading a program within the Young President's Organization uh, to take uh, mental health and use uh, a model called Scalathon. So for example, if there's a mental health platform, uh, which is in Toronto, uh, uh, we, we are trying to use the power of YPO with 190 chapters across the world uh, and to try to say that there's a, maybe a chapter in Tokyo or there's a, ch a chapter in Tampa, uh, which can take these uh, platforms which are there and try to scale it around. And uh, we're doing kind of an X-Price challenge and come through from the mental health. The pandemic, uh, 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 I mean, has changed the way we operate, it's, it's made us more digital. That's uh, in a way it's enabled this conference uh, for us to sit into in, in our homes and uh, uh, and then actually do this. And in terms of, uh, I think we become more human as well. And then it's also allowed a lot of innovation to happen. Uh, so especially in education, I think we have to thank the Canadians, uh, uh, everyone in Canada, uh, I think uh, on behalf of, uh, all of us at Tiagrada Polytechnic and SONA, we need to really thank the C, the Association of Canadian Community Colleges. Because way back uh, in the 90s, uh, when Canada wanted to give the best practices of education to us, uh, to India, so they wanted to select the, uh, the uh, best college and try to take that to the next level. And that's how we got linked to. And in 96, I came in to, with the New Brunswick Community College in the Miramichi, uh, and we signed up the agreement for e-learning. So that has become our backbone today, because if we hadn't done that in 96 and 2000, uh, we wouldn't be so strong in an e-learning infrastructure uh, in terms of all our classrooms are recorded. And that's how we went from 200 classrooms to 12,000 classrooms. Because when I say 12,000 classrooms, because every student is at home, literally learning. And through the AI proctored uh, uh, thing as well. So India, uh, I think I'll just flip through some of these, so some, some of the things we are working now is we're actually working with a client of ours, uh, John Hopkins, uh, in terms of trying to get that content, get content from ICMR and, 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 uh, and to put them into an app uh, for home quarantine uh, on a social basis with uh, some of the videos from uh, some leading content around the world. And I think uh, Dr. Lucky Lakshmanan, uh, our friend and mentor, was uh, actually explaining about this oxygen uh, bed because uh, we are trying to take uh, the beds to where the oxygen is and then we are providing the food and anadanam for that particular thing. And uh, we are also setting up a step-down hospital uh, uh, which is getting inaugurated tomorrow, a 150-bed step-down hospital in our campus. And uh, we are providing oxygen uh, concentrators to community-based hospitals on a sharing basis. Uh, and another program that our foundation is working on right now is on rural villages. How do we vaccinate? So we're developing electric vans to go vaccinate rural villages. So we want to work with the different foundations around the world uh, on that. Uh, so let, we're coming closer to the, the, the topic. Uh, uh, I think UHN collaboration that we just announced uh, uh, about uh, two months ago, uh, it's, it's actually a foundational Thing for us at SONA that we are very excited that uh, uh, nine uh, universities in the Toronto area uh, where this conference is happening, we are excited that UHN, uh, University of Toronto and all the other institutions uh, are joining together 
and working with Sona in terms of uh, looking at uh, variable therapeutic technologies. Uh, and I, uh, and the, the main emphasis of, of this is to improve people's lives uh, uh, living with health-related challenges. Uh, so how do we do these things? So that's, uh, uh, that's something that we want to work together because India, especially this region between Salem, Coimbatore, uh, is the heart of the Indian textile industry. And uh, we have great textile engineers. So how do we combine that with Canada, uh, the latest technology and, uh, and, and all of that? And how do we make things wearable? So, uh, so we're looking at different fabrics uh, because right now wearable technology uh, is in terms of watches or something which is more electric. It's, so we are trying to get into the weaving and to the spinning of uh, uh, the core of uh, the wearable technology. So that's the, that's the focus here. So, and uh, so we've been involved, uh, uh, V Technologies as a company, we've been involved uh, with healthcare in the US for about 20 years. And uh, I think a lot of you would be knowing about the Medicare Advantage plans in the US, uh, uh, which has been there. And uh, so today we manage about 30 million lives uh, in the US on what is called a risk capture platform. Uh, so the, the earlier we would have coders go through these charts and the entire history of the patient comes to us. Uh, and we have like, you know, sometimes it's three, 400 pages. And uh, uh, I was actually amused. Uh, one page was 15,000 pages of records came in for one patient. So you'll have to go through all of this and then uh, pick up uh, what is called a meet, uh, uh, the, which is meaningful, effective, applicable treatments. Uh, so, so we put uh, an NLP uh, AI in, uh, as well as an NLP solution uh, trying to figure out where, what is it, so that we can make the coder into, uh, uh, make him a super powered coder. So whereas technology companies are trying to make the coder obsolete. So we are trying to come from a, since we come from a services industry, we're trying to make uh, the coder uh, super power charge them. So the benefits are to like, you know, how can we double the productivity of the coder and use the coder as well. Uh, and then the, the idea is to find out these things so that pre-visit, before the patient comes in, we can find out what are the, the potential comorbidities, if they have diabetes, would they have diabetic retinopedia, would, uh, uh, would a $50 test uh, today uh, uh, prevent uh, a $5,000 surgery uh, later, like, you know, with diabetic retinopedia or potential with glaucoma or any of this. So, uh, uh, and that's how this uh, platform uh, evolved working with the insurance companies in the US. And now we are trying to take this to the, the providers and that's how the pre-visit, the point of care and post-visit follow-ups, uh, especially the ACOs, the accountable care organizations. And uh, uh, the whole idea now is uh, trying to go into a system of wellness. So from getting sick care, we're trying to move into a well care, wellness care. Uh, so that's how the, uh, the, the, the whole idea has evolved. And we've actually converted this to, uh, we're trying to indigenize it to a system called V+. So what V+, does is uh, we're trying to move from curative care to preventive care. Uh, yeah, and we are trying to take this to the villages. The same vaccination vans that I told you that we are looking for is going to be repurposed into this preventive care at the rural area. So what's happening is that uh, for a common man, there are primary health clinics. India has done an extensive, uh, excellent job in developing primary health care clinics. But India being a vast country, sometimes people have to travel great distances. So, and we are trying to take the latest technology, all Bluetooth enabled, all the doctors are going to be sitting in the cities or wherever they are, and through telemedicine are able to go and interact with these patients. Uh, and we have the risk stratification engine which will tell us what could go wrong and through which we do preventive medicine uh, and are able to actually treat the, treat the patients uh, and look at, looking at it from a holistic platform. Uh, and the whole idea is that we are trying to get through servicing healthcare, including medicine at $1 a patient per month. So that's the focus of this. Uh, coming, uh, I just put in a couple of case studies together so that you'll get a flavor of some of the things we do. So this was a, a, a dear friend of ours and a, and a guide of ours, Dr. Devi Shetty at Narayana Hidyalaya. Uh, so uh, uh, visiting his uh, ICU, 
uh, cardi card uh, pediatric cardiology ICU is, is the world's largest and it's a very traumatic experience. You have these young kids, literally babies, like two days old, one day old, they're having a, a heart surgery. And uh, uh, if a nurse makes one mistake, like, you know, uh, even one bubble of air goes inside uh, that uh, uh, intravenous uh, stuff, the kid is dead. Uh, so, uh, and the nurses are called at different times to come in and start uh, uh, because the time is not scheduled. So they, they've been woken up and they asked to come in. So they need to make sure that they are completely oriented before it. So we've developed 25 cardiac uh, arthmias uh, between the Narayan Hidyalaya Hospital in, uh, in Bangalore, as well as the University of Michigan uh, uh, help us uh, as well in terms of trying to figure out how these things can uh, happen. And uh, we worked on ECG interpretations uh, and uh, uh, are able to guide the nurses into different areas. So they, it's actually a gamified version uh, of a student nurse module uh, before they get in. So one is for nurses to learn, other one is for nurses to go inside. Uh, I thought I'll just put in an example of Code 9 because it's a Toronto-based company and it's a little bit in the healthcare industry, especially from a hygiene perspective. Uh, uh, so we had we did a work for stake model here and uh, we co-own this company uh, and uh, it came out through the pandemic because hand washing is becoming much more critical uh, because that's the only way to get rid. I mean, uh, we know Dr. Tehran was there. She spoke about uh, double masking, but uh, from a hand hygiene perspective, I think if what 9-11 did in, uh, for security, I think COVID is done for, uh, for healthcare. It's brought healthcare into the center of most of the organizations today. And that's how Code 9 came about. Uh, so we do the daily wellness assessment, safety audit, uh, like, you know, touchless monitoring and, uh, and things like, and there's a dashboard which is given to the a company as to find out what, and you can actually figure out, uh, we have these badges where you can figure out how many people uh, wash their hands, how many hours, especially in a medical healthcare environment, it becomes critical. Uh, and uh, so bot H uh, is a very interesting development uh, that we have done. So you've heard of bots like Automation Anywhere or UiPath or uh, Softomotive, uh, uh, Blue Prism. So uh, some of these are bots. So one of the things that we have done is V Technologies has developed a, a, a bot H. We call it bot H because we don't, we're not only doing what any of those bots can do, but we also provide the service along with it because uh, being a services company. And our, uh, we've started uh, botifying a lot of the uh, healthcare operations as a service model uh, for the US hospitals. Uh, and the, so the, the, the additional, uh, the difference is that if you go buy, uh, say, uh, automation anywhere or something, and then you need to build a layer on top of it, uh, giving us the objective of actually having our own software here. Uh, helps. Uh, so that's how the whole design has come about. So we can architect uh, a layer of AI over it and make the bot work. And, uh, uh, and we are able to actually do the entire life cycle of it. So some of the use cases of pre-arrival services, uh, you know, background verification. Uh, so if you look at a pre-arrival services in a hospital, uh, the, the, you know, the, the verifying patient eligibility, so it goes through the entire insurance uh, 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 eligibility benefits and then uh, looks at the co-pays and the deductibles and all of it. So uh, uh, that uh, and uh, another thing, the vocal cord paralysis uh, is, is a problem uh, which I personally went through, uh, 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 my father went through. So I learned about this problem and I wanted to solve this problem. So it's a personal problem of mine that I solved. Uh, so, uh, so people lose their voice. The vocal cord works like this, and then all of a sudden, one day we don't know why or what it stopped. So, and luckily, we took him to University of uh, 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 Mass General in Boston and uh, Center for Vocal Cord Paralysis, and then got him uh, uh, got the surgery done. But I said that uh, there should be a non-surgical way of how to solve this problem. So that's how uh, we've came, we've come up with the AI module of trying to figure out what the original voice was before the person went through. So of course you can't, if, if I speak to you face to face, you can't make out the voice change because it'll be speaking. But if I spoke to you on a phone, it reverts back to my old voice. 
uh, the shrill voice or whatever the voice happens post vocal cord paralysis, the whole thing is taken back uh, uh, into the original voice. So you, we, we are doing the voice cloning of it. Uh, and uh, so using AI, we built the module. And uh, so uh, this has come out well. So uh, the deduction of pulmonary embolism, especially right now, uh, uh, you, you know, so we've done the CT angiograms and looked at image analysis and uh, are able to actually predict with about 91% uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, using the deep neural network. So uh, uh, I'm just flipping through these because uh, it's for want of time. Uh, uh, breast cancer diagnosis is another thing we've been working with uh, villages uh, in and around the Salem area uh, on how do we uh, take the decision support so we've built uh, uh, the, the engine to learn about 10 different scenarios in these images, which are most of the cases uh, in terms of uh, what, the, uh, what the image analysis would be. Uh, and uh, uh, we flip, uh, the, the, uh, the AI basically helps the uh, radiologist perform better and uh, they're able to use the CDSS uh, clinical decision support system uh, to about 92% accuracy uh, uh, that we've got. And uh, 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 what we've done is we've gone to different villages and uh, we've got a lot of early stage uh, uh, reductions. So, uh, I mean, this is uh, in sample right now. So in the last few months, we've deducted five patients uh, and prevented cancer in stage one. And we've also taken stage three and uh, uh, stage three patients, a couple of stage three patients and uh, prevented that through the uh, support in the hospital. Uh, cardiovascular disease prediction, again, uh, it uses uh, some biomarkers and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 image analysis, and we are actually able to uh, prevent this through uh, the retina scanning uh, of, the, uh, of the patients, so through, uh, and then finding out, especially patients who have blood pressure, uh, we are finding out the variations through the retinal images on uh, figuring, it out, figuring it out. Uh, Hayami is another interesting uh, thing that uh, we are doing here. So I thought we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, so Hayami is actually, uh, India is a young country and every 1.28 seconds, we need to generate a job. Uh, so what we said is that we will develop a platform uh, where any student can go for free, upload uh, his assessment for 100 minutes and a 20 second video, three 20 second videos of one minute. And they have an AI uh, proctored assessment module. So looking at the facial expressions. Uh, and uh, so we have 2 million users right now. Uh, and uh, the vision is to enable 3 million jobs. Uh, and uh, what uh, I thought we'll speak about uh, the AI uh, 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 facial recognition module. Uh, so it's able to recognize emotion. Uh, and uh, especially in a classroom or it could be anywhere, you can find out who's attentive, who's confused, who's disinterested. Uh, uh, and so you can direct questions to certain people. Uh, and uh, this is through the image analysis. And uh, also the, uh, uh, what Hayami does is uh, we've entered into the X prize in the US on rapid reskilling on how can you take a person and uh, 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 double uh, in half the time reskill them. Uh, and we were lucky that out of the 108 teams that qualified, we became one of the 10 finalists. Uh, uh, and uh, we are working in, this, in the state of mass uh, and uh, we are skilling displaced workers, about 600 of them right now. And we're using a lot of, uh, 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 as we learn uh, through this, we are using a lot of AI in terms of trying to bring in uh, the analytics uh, to shorten the, the learning cycle of it. So uh, I think, uh, uh, for want of time, so I'll, I'll be short, like, you know, so I'll end my presentation there. Uh, so just a wish from all of us. Thank you, Dr. Lucky Lakshman, and uh, it's an honor. Uh, uh, we are very, very appreciative of you giving us this time. Uh, we are also very excited to, uh, 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 for the student uh, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, the program that you had. Uh, I think we, we were delighted that uh, both the companies which came out uh, were from uh, the therapeutics uh, as well as the robotics. Uh, and uh, both are very relevant today. So uh, I, I, I thank you and uh, uh, thank you for the time and uh, really appreciate uh, really appreciate the time. So thank you, Dr. Thank you very much, Choko. It always has been a pleasure meeting you and discussing. 
never have you discussed on any personal issue. Always it is serving the community, serving the masses. Thank you very much. Also, at this time, I want to thank you for your support, helping our young, innovative entrepreneurs in the healthcare space. We appreciate you coming forward, not alone supporting one, but you have supported two. Thank you very much, Choco. Be from CAF and Organizing Committee. Thank you profoundly for your participation and generosity. Thank you very much. I Thank now you. hand it over to Professor Arun Chokalinga. Good afternoon. Thank you, Choco. That was a brilliant presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed every bit of what you said and proud to have your contribution to the whole world. Thank you, Choco. Uh, it is my unique pleasure to introduce one of our Canadian superstars in infectious disease, Dr. Brian Watt. He is a professor of uh, infectious disease at McGill University, a learned scholar, and he also serves as the chair of the advisory committee, institutional advisory committee of the CAHR Institute for Immunity and uh, Infections. And Dr. Ward, not only a scientist from the bench to bedside, but he's also an entrepreneur. So he is part of the Medicago, which is in phase three trial to find the vaccines and uh, <clears throat> their uh, race is on. And we will hear from Dr. Ward about their progress and accomplishments. Brian, up to you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give this um, group a little bit of an update. Um, it's daunting to follow the pre pre previous speakers because we are um, a tiny company, uh, as you will see, although it is our intent not to stay that way for long. Um, and I, I really like the idea of um, the previous speakers, um, Choco Valiapa's idea of botifying. Um, I think that there are many things in our production stream that could be botified. Um, this is the overview of the talk. It would be quite short because it will be focused on our COVID vaccine that is in its phase three clinical trial right now. Uh, compared to the previous speakers, MedicaGo is a tiny company. Um, uh, we've been in business uh, uh, for 20 years, but we actually haven't made any money yet um, because uh, our first commercial products will probably be licensed this year. Uh, we have two production facilities, which I'll um, show you right at the end, one in Canada and St. Croix, Quebec, and the other in North Carolina. We currently have uh, slightly more than 450 employees, and we've run um, a, a quite a number of clinical trials um, looking at uh, the five uh, vaccines that we have in the pipeline. Uh, our lead product until COVID was an inf were influenza vaccines, um, but uh, currently, obviously, our focus is on COVID. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar um, with the, the, the platform, um, it is a, a, an unusual platform, and I think we will be the first virus-like particle vaccine um, licensed for COVID uh, later this summer. But it's a recombinant platform that uses plants as the bioreactor. We use an Australian relative of the tobacco plant, Nicotiana benthamiana. We use a process called agroinfiltration, where we deliver a small piece of DNA uh, into the cell, uh, cells of the leaves of the plants by immersing them in a bath um, of agrobacterium. Uh, we then um, turn the plants upright again, uh, leave them in our in carefully controlled um, uh, greenhouses for a period of four to six days, harvest the leaves and the, exos uh, the exosomal expression of the protein um, uh, results in the um, uh, production of spike proteins, which trimerize, move to the surface of the cell, and then spontaneously form virus-like particles at the surface and bud off the surface of the plant cell into the virtual space between the plant cell membrane and the cell wall, which is then digested away in a series of 
uh, standard commercial uh, procedures uh, after that point uh, result in a highly purified virus-like particle. Um, why, why can't I move forward? Okay. Um, this is what our virus-like particle for SARS-CoV-2 looks like. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see that it's an envelope virus-like particle with the spike proteins as trimers studding off the surface. This looks very much like the wild-type virus, which you see in the electron micrograph below to the right. And the spike protein is actually uh, mutated so that it stays in a pre-fusion configuration, which is highly immunogenic and also antibodies directed against the spike protein in this configuration are um, highly neutralizing. So where are we in this process? We, like other people, started with the uh, sequence information released uh, by the Chinese scientists in uh, early in 2020. We rapidly determined that we could make a virus-like particle vaccine, tested it in mice and monkeys. It proved to be quite effective in preventing illness in the monkeys. Um, and we started our phase one study simultaneously in July of 2020. We moved rapidly to the phase two, uh, which has now been completed and we entered into phase three um, about a month ago. We are currently recruiting in five countries with another uh, four to five countries to be recruited. And we'll be recruiting up to um, uh, 30,000 individuals in this study. In the, phase one, in the phase one study, we looked at different dose levels. We looked at two different adjuvants, uh, Dynavax's CPG1018 and GSK's ASO3. And it was very clear that the ASO3 adjuvant from GSK, which they call their pandemic adjuvant, um, was, um, had some very highly favorable characteristics. So we have moved forward into the phase two and the phase three with a two dose schedule at 3.75 micrograms of our virus-like particle with the ASO3 adjuvant. And I'll just show you very briefly the phase two data that has just been released. Um, and here you see the data from healthy adults um, and elderly individuals over on the left side, you see local solicited reactions on the right side, you see uh, solicited systemic reactions and you see the first dose after the first dose and after the second dose. And you can see quite clearly um, on the left-hand panel that most people say they have pain in response to this vaccine, but the vast majority of these local events are mild to moderate. Similarly, um, for the systemic reactions, many people report one uh, or more reactions. Most of them are mild to moderate, um, and they are all transient, resolving in one to three days. Um, these are very similar profiles to most of the other vaccines that have been reported, the, ad, uh, the adeno vectored vaccines and the RNA vaccines, with the notable exception that there is very little febrile response. Most people do not report fever after receiving this vaccine even as two doses, and that's on the right-hand side, the second set of graphs down. This vaccine is also remarkably immunogenic. Um, here I'm showing you the antibody response on the left-hand side and the cellular response on the right-hand side, starting at day zero, then day 21 after the first dose and day 42 after the second dose. And the filled in red triangles are the responses of healthy adults. And you can see that in a, neutralization assay that you get a remarkable immune response up into the 2000 range uh, for neutralizing antibody responses in the healthy adults, which is essentially replicated in the older individuals, those over the age of 65. At the far right-hand side of the antibody response panel, you can see the responses of 35 individuals who have suffered from natural COVID. So these are convalescent sera. And you can see that the responses, both in the healthy adults and in the elderly individuals, um, are tenfold higher than those seen in the convalescent sera. So a very strong antibody response. On the right-hand side of the panel, you have a similar um, a display of our data from the phase two study, where we have an excellent cellular immune response. In this case, it's a gamma interferon response. Um, which is very important for uh, resolving infections. You can see in the darker red circles that there is a pre-existing immunity, probably due to uh, background activity against um, uh, human coronaviruses, but that is boosted substantially by our vaccine. 
so that by 21 days after the second dose, there is a striking LE spot. So the number of cells that are producing gamma interferon um, is very high. The older individuals have a slightly more sluggish response, but the time they have received two doses, they have almost caught up with the adults in terms of their cellular response. So a very strong response. These are data that were organized by COVAX and presented by Peter Dahl at a recent um, uh, COVAX webinar. And they are an attempt to predict efficacy based on neutralizing antibody responses. And these are published data from different vaccines. And across the top of each of these graphs, you can see the relative amount of neutralizing antibody produced compared to a panel of convalescent sera in each of these different studies. And you can see that they range from lower than convalescent sera over on the right-hand side, up to about three to four-fold higher than convalescent sera to the left-hand side, where you have the RNA vaccines and Novavax, um, which is another protein and adjuvant vaccine. On the bottom, you can see the reported efficacy for these different vaccines. And you can see that there is a very close correlation between the neutralizing antibody responses relative to convalescent serum and the efficacy. So this is thought to be um, a, a potential uh, correlative immunity. So if you look at our data from the phase two study and the, the healthy adults and the older individuals, you can see that our vaccine elicited a tenfold higher neutralizing antibody response. And of course, we are hoping that this will translate into uh, a very high efficacy against this, um, against the, uh, the uh, uh, original vaccine. But also we hope because we're starting with such high neutralizing titers that we will also have efficacy against the variants that are now circulating. Um, this is a, um, uh, we've used the construct that was suggested by Curie et al to look at our serologic responses to two doses of our vaccine and how well they might neutralize the variants in vitro. And off to the right, you can see displayed in two different ways, the actual neutralizing antibody titers using a wild type assay performed in Siena, Italy by Viz Medri. And at the top, you see the circles representing the total of those populations. And these neutralizing antibody responses are divided up into what are considered to be relatively low. So a one in 50 dilution between one in 50 titer, uh, uh, one in 50 and one in 400 titers, and then much higher titers up to 10,000. And you can see that against the original Wuhan strain, our vaccine elicits um, essentially in all of the study participants, um, a very strong antibody response. Um, and all of the subjects fall into the area higher than um, one in 50 dilution for the neutralizing antibody response. And then you see as you move further to the right that you have the UK variant, the Brazil variant and the South African variant. We do not yet have data for the newly emerging Indian variant or some of the others. And you can see, as others have reported, that there is a fall in the neutralizing ability of these antibodies. However, even for the South African and the Brazilian variant, more than 90% of the individuals who've received two doses of our vaccine have antibody titers that are higher than one in 50. So we are very hopeful that in fact, this will translate into good efficacy, not only against the original strain, but also against these new variants. And if you actually look at the, um, uh, the construct on the left, which is an analysis looking on the y-axis of the vaccine efficacy versus the relative amount of neutralizing antibody on the x-axis compared to convalescent serum, you can see that looking at many different studies, the, this relationship between neutralizing antibodies and efficacy actually holds quite well. And using this construct, if you look, for example, for the Brazilian variant, even though there is a substantial fall in the neutralizing antibody responses, we are still well above um, the uh, antibodies that are produced in con by convalescent uh, patients. And based on this, we would hope that we will find that even against the Brazilian variant, we will be in the range um, of some of the better performing vaccines um, when we get our efficacy data in the next two to three months. So this is where we are now. We've started our phase three. We're currently enrolling in five countries. We're going up to 130,000 subjects. 
And we hope to have um, collected, identified 160 cases, which is our cut point for when we will actually unblind the study and analyze the data. And then hopefully by Q3 2021, apply for emergency use authorization um, in several countries. Um, I think that uh, overall, um, there is some reason to be optimistic um, because we have a very nice safety profile, no serious adverse events that are related to the vaccine so far, and the neutralizing and cellular immune responses are actually very substantial. So I said at the beginning, we were a tiny company, um, and we are. We currently have uh, just under 500 employees. We have a small pilot facility in Quebec. Um, uh, on the left, our current commercial facility is in North Carolina, which you see now, and we now have the ability to produce somewhere between 100 and 200 million doses of our COVID vaccine. However, on the far right, you see why I said that we hope not to be this small for very long. Um, our major global production facility is nearing completion and will be certified, we hope, by the end of 2023, early 2024. In this facility, we would have the capacity to produce up to 1 billion doses of vaccine in a 12 month period for the next pandemic. Um, so key messages for our vaccine, we're obviously not one of the front runners, but we're not last either. Um, and um, we are, I think, going to be able to report out what we hope will be good results um, in the next month or two. Um, the adverse events in younger individuals, as well as older individual, individuals, are really uh, uh, quite benign. We see excellent antibody and cellular responses across the age range, um, including comorbid individuals. I haven't shown you those data because they haven't been quality um, uh, controlled yet, but basically it's a carbon copy of what you've seen for the healthy adults and the healthy older individuals. This vaccine has substantial advantages. Um, because it is able to be stored at two to eight degrees centigrade. And we are using a well-characterized adjuvant, ASO3 in the context of pandemic influenza, has a large safety database in children, pregnant and lactating women. So we think that even though we are late coming um, to contribute to resolving the COVID uh, pandemic, that there will be a place for us um, uh, in the coming months. So with that, I'll stop and say thank you to all of our employees who are exhausted over, uh, with the work that we've done over the last 12 to 14 months. Collaborators, we've been supported by the Government of Canada and Quebec. Um, and uh, of course, all of the investigators and participants who have contributed uh, and who are contributing to the success of our studies. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to present at this meeting. Thank you very much, Brian. It's quite a brilliant presentation. You have been humble to say more than once that you're a small company and you're not uh, yet in the, in the market. But I have no doubts, I have every confidence that you will be a major company, a major player to produce vaccine. And we as Canadians, are very proud of what you're doing and setting off to the races. And really, really thank you from the bottom of our heart. And thank you so much. Thank you. Well, this concludes the plenary part of the session. And I would like to uh, ask all of you to join the breakout sessions on artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and pandemic response. And you will be getting a message in your chat box as to where to go. But prior to that, it will be very important and, and honor for us to thank all our supports who made this possible. Sona College of Technology, and you heard Mr. Chokovalyapa speak, and he has supported us in multiple ways. Then 5G technology, Valenza, and individually Ravi Kumar and Kavita Subramanian, as well as our sponsors, BBI, uh, go back, BBI vaccines, uh, Devonian, and as well as uh, Saskatchewan government and Bido uh, vaccines. 
So as you can see in the next sessions, you will hear in the biotechnology session, yeah, another vaccine manufacturer will be speaking. And in the uh, pandemic response, uh, VBA technology, VBA vaccines will be speaking. So there are three vaccine manufacturers from Canada who are participating in this event. And uh, all that I can say is it is a brilliant presentation and great efforts. And every one of the sessions that you're waiting to listen to, they all have great speakers. Don't miss anybody. Enjoy it. Thank you for your participation.